Hey guys, Claire here, and in today's video, we're going to talk about all things Harry and Meghan. Prince Harry's memoir Spare is the best-selling book of 2023, according to Amazon UK, which is interesting because I don't know about you, but I remember the countless articles and polls from the UK press telling us that the UK will not be interested in reading Harry's book. The facts and statistics say otherwise. Now, not only that, Spare has also made it onto people's top 10 books of 2023. We also saw photos of Megan at a Netflix event for the movie After. Megan moderated a discussion with longtime friend Misan and the starring actor David. Well, we're just looking at some of your portraits now. I mean, some famous faces there from the acting world. You, you know, you, you photographed the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. In fact, you produced a famous image for them when they were growing their young family, mm. when Meghan mm. and Harry were going through um, their second pregnancy. Mm. What were they like to work with? Because I know the, the Duchess of Sussex in particular is a big supporter of yours. She mm. hosted a screening yes. of your new film out yeah. in LA recently. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the pregnancy announcement were taken on an iPad virtually uh, <laughs> during lockdown, uh, because obviously we couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. I couldn't go to California. And it's, you know, she's an old friend and it's just been a great honor to document their love, uh, their fortitude, and to have her believe in my story as a visual storyteller. It's been just an honor. And you've produced some iconic images uh, for them. And I know that you've traveled with Harry to the Invictus Games. Mm -hmm. That's a relationship uh, with Harry that you have through those games. How is it important is it to you to combine that social activism, the importance of something like the Invictus Games and your work? How did the two dovetail in, in your I work mean, with the couple? I mean, you know, I don't want to tear up. Invictus, I, I just cried every day because mm. I haven't seen such unfiltered humanity. Mm. You know, these men and women and their families, what they've been through, you're talking about veterans that have lost so much, mm. both um, mental and physical ailments, and to have them... Um, compete at that level mm. through what the Duke has has created. Mm. It's just photographically, it's amazing, but it's also very inspirational. That's a collaboration with the Duke. What about the Duchess? Because she has signed with an LA agency, and I know that you're now entering into film. She could be coming back into film. Could you, as friends, combine on something in the future? Do you think as a, as a project, perhaps? You know, she has. She's very busy, <laughs> um, and and we'll see. We'll see what what fate throws at us. But I, I've been very lucky to. to to support and also be supported by them. Okay. Harry and Meghan's Archwell Foundation released its 2022 impact report. Now I did an entire video on this and I'll link it somewhere on the screen. In that video, we went in depth into the impact report, comparing it to the Royal Foundation, which is head by William and Kate, and also combat some of the misinformation coming from the UK tabloids concerning Archwell. Prince Harry and Meghan also released their Happy Holidays card with a photo of them from this year's Invictus Games. Special congratulations to ITV's Tom Bradbury, who was named Interviewer of the Year for his interview with Prince Harry for the book Spare. And for those of you who don't know the tea, Tom Bradbury used to be friends with both Harry and William, but apparently William cast him aside because Bradbury continued to remain friendly with Harry. Well, I shouldn't say friendly, but impartial. God, he's such a fragile little thing, isn't he? Today it was revealed that Camilla will be doing a podcast of her own. And <laughs> first they criticize, then they copy. You know what I'm saying? Now on to the main event. Prince Harry has won his case. Seeing the reactions on social media has been very interesting. On Twitter, Prince Harry was trending all day. And also, it's been very interesting to hear some of the people in the UK press uh, go into details about how important this landmark case is and how influential it would be going forward. This case is not just about hacking. It is about a systemic practice of unlawful and appalling behavior, followed by cover-ups and destruction of evidence the shocking scale of which can only be revealed through these proceedings. The court has found that Mirror Group's principal board directors, their legal department, senior executives and editors such as Piers Morgan clearly knew about or were involved in these illegal activities. Between them, 
They even went as far as lying under oath to Parliament during the Leveson inquiry, to the stock exchange and to us all ever since. The journey to justice can be a slow and painful one. And since bringing my claim almost five years ago, defamatory stories and intimidating tactics have been deployed against me and at my family's expense. And so, as I too have learned through this process, patience is in fact a virtue, especially in the face of vendetta journalism. I hope that the court's findings will serve as a warning to all media organisations who have employed these practices and then similarly lied about them. Mirror Group's actions were so calculated and misleading that their pattern of destroying evidence and concealing their unlawful behaviour continued into the litigation itself and, as the judge has ruled, even to this day. What we are learning is that Harry, Prince Harry, is one of those few people who is willing to see this through to the end, that he has said he'll take the stand, he'll be in court. He wants to do this, I'm imagining, because he somehow thinks of it as vindication for everything that his mother went through and everything that she died actually for. And I wonder whether somewhere this has become a very, very emotional question for Harry. It's clearly not about the money. He's just saying, I want to see Murdoch brought to his knees over this. I think that's exactly right. I mean, look, I think that he's got the money to do it. And crucially, he's got the will to do it. And that's the difference, right, with all of the other people who've come and gone before. Most people who have engaged in this, they don't want the endless endless story and the stories that come their way as a result of taking these people on harry's been there he's done it mm -hmm. and his whole objective isn't to get the money it is to i think in some sense we saw it when we saw the megan and harry documentary we saw it in spare i think there's a sense he has of destiny with this that this is his role mm -hmm. now is to bring truth to teach truth to these institutions. It is Harry against the world. And the reason this matters isn't just because this is like a royal salacious story. The point is, then the capacity for collateral damage and for huge damage, not only against Murdoch, not only against the wider press, but indeed the collateral damage on the royal family itself could be huge. Yeah. And we know, frankly, he doesn't care. Today's ruling in favour of Prince Harry as the victim of phone hacking is monumental. Not just in legal terms, because this involves liability and damages for NGM Group, but more broadly, because it required Harry's level of celebrity, entitlement and money. He had to be bonkers rich and famous to be able to do this. In the world of the free press, post Levinson, half of which was kicked into the long grass, in the end, they became their own judge and jury. Not good enough, but until you had a key establishment player leaving the establishment and turning his guns around on the lawn and pointing it straight at them, there was not sufficient accountability. And what else does this tell us, which will be uncomfortable for the institution of monarchy? It tells us that Harry was right. He genuinely had a cross to bear and he wasn't sufficiently supported by the royal family. When you were listening to that judgment, how did it make you feel and how seismic did you feel this was for, for Britain? I think it's interesting that it's taken somebody of Prince Harry's level of fame, entitlement and wealth to push this into the courts and deliver a verdict I think most of us knew is the right verdict and was coming down the pipeline. In other words, he was an eminently establishment player, a royal, and he had to leave not only the establishment, but also the country in order to feel suitably emboldened to turn his tanks right around on the lawn and fire them in the face of our allegedly free press. The significance of Harry is twofold. A, he's got enough money that he is saying, I don't care what you offer me. I don't care how much it costs if I lose. I'm going to have a hearing. Do you know there's more than, well, there's nearly 2,000 phone hacking cases have been silenced. 
where the people suing have been paid off before they could get to court. The risks of going on were just too terrifying financially. But you still have newspapers who abuse their power and using falsehood, distortion and spite damage this country over and over again. And uh, the British government over security. But nonetheless, today, a significant win for Prince Harry and the other claimants in this case. 15 out of 33 articles in this phone. And just, sorry, a bit of extra information as well. Um, Mr Justice Fancourt says the claims of soap actress Nikki Sanderson and the ex-wife of comedian Paul Whitehouse, Fiona Whiteman, those claims are barred because times for their claims have expired. It's interesting because, as I said earlier, right at the start of the trial, so seven months ago, the High Court was told that the Mirror, the Daily Mirror newspaper itself, apologised unreservedly to Prince Harry for unlawfully gathering information about him. So some of this seems to have been established a long time ago, right at the start yeah. of the process. Interesting, the word probably, that Harry's phone was probably mm. at. Just to step back from this for a moment. Matthew, might, yes, Prince Harry has won £140,600 in damages. The judge has just ruled I that. I suspect that won't interest him. And I think that some people might lack empathy for Harry because they'll think of him as a, a man of money and power and influence. Mm. But actually, and, and you might disagree or agree, Mike, taking on the tabloid press in this country mm. for anyone mm. is not an easy thing but to it, do. It, and to do it in court, asked questions, oh, yeah. is actually a very challenging thing to do. So I I, have, I, I actually have quite a lot of respect for Harry on this. Mm -hmm. Only the rich can take on the tabloid press in this country, believe me. They just wear you down until you, you run away. This is a massive victory for Harry. I mean, really massive. You've got to remember, in, in, when it all started, the phone hacking, it was the sun or the news of the world. But in the background, other media groups were doing it, and this has proven another one has been doing it. It's massive because it helps Harry. Yeah, he won. Harry won the case. <laughs> News of the outcome of Prince Harry's case, of course, has also made it to the news in the U.S. Breaking news from overseas now. Prince Harry declared victory this morning when a British judge ruled that his phone had, in fact, been hacked by a major newspaper group. NBC's Molly Hunter joins us from London. She's got the very latest. Hey, Molly, good morning. Hoda, good morning to you. That's right. This is a big deal, a landmark ruling for Prince Harry. The first of three of Harry's lawsuits actually making their way through the British court system right now. And this morning, as you say, Prince Harry was victorious. So Prince Harry alleged that journalists from the Mirror Group newspapers targeted him and his inner circle by gaining access to voicemails and used other unlawful methods, causing him, quote, considerable distress. Now, the judge found that in 15 out of 33 articles submitted, there was evidence that MGN, that's the newspaper, paper group had engaged in unlawful information gathering, including phone hacking. Now, the judge said it appeared Harry's personal phone was targeted between 2004 and 2009, so this happened a while ago. But Harry was awarded about $180,000 in damages today. In a statement, the media group said they take, quote, full responsibility and apologize unreservedly. Now, Harry was not present here in court today, but his lawyer did speak outside the court, reading a statement from the prince, and I think we have that to show our audience. He said this case is not just about hacking. It is about a systematic practice of unlawful and appalling behavior, followed by cover-ups and destruction of evidence, adding, today's ruling is vindicating and affirming. I've been told that slaying dragons will get you burned, but in light of today's victory and the importance of doing what is needed for a free and honest press, it is a worthwhile price to pay. The mission continues. That is a statement from Prince Harry. And this is a big deal, of course. This is a long-running battle for Prince Harry against British tabloids. Piers Morgan responded by lashing out at Prince Harry, essentially saying that Harry holding him and the press accountable for their misdeeds is somehow akin to Harry trying to destroy the monarchy. And Piers is essentially saying the quiet part out loud, that the relationship between the press and the palace is so heavily intertwined that when you're exposing one, you're essentially exposing the other, proving Harry's point once again. Let's not forget that a couple months ago when the case started, the tabloid had apologized to Harry and they also said, hey, some of the stories came from the royal family. We didn't hack. That is where we got the information from. So today's judgment that some of the stories did essentially come from the tabloid hacking Prince Harry just proves that Harry was right all along. His family and their staff and the tabloids are both responsible for leaking the nasty stories, for invading his privacy in the worst way, without any care or concern But what this invasion of privacy does to Harry's mental health. I do want to ask you if you have ever listened to a voicemail without the consent of one of the participants. No, I've made it very clear. My position on hacking is I have never hacked a phone. 
I've never told anyone to hack your phone. No one's produced any evidence, including in this case. But you listened to a tape of a voicemail message, is that correct? I listened to a tape of a message, yes. But it was a voicemail message, wasn't it? Uh, I believed it was, yes. There was a spate of stories that came out because of mobile phones. When they first came out, mobile phones, journalists found out that if the celebrity hadn't changed their PIN code, yeah, the, you right. can access their voicemail. You can ac access their voicemail just by tapping it on. But now, are you really telling me that journalists aren't going to do that? Yeah. If they know they can ring up Charlotte Church's mobile phone, listen to all her messages. They can't. Right? Now, all you have to do, and I know it's hard because celebrities don't like doing anything for themselves, <laughs> is actually change your security yeah, number. Yeah, I've changed my security number. And now you don't have to worry. Exactly. Who's not having a happy Friday? Piers Morgan. Piers just gave a statement minutes ago outside his front door in regards to the verdict in Prince Harry's case against the Mirror Group today. Recall, Piers Morgan was the editor from 95 to 2004. And the judge had some things to say about Mr. Piers Morgan, including the fact that he knew about phone hacking and that the judge found Mr. Omitskobi to be a straightforward and reliable witness. And the judge accepted what he said about Mr. Morgan's involvement in a Minogue story that involved hacking. Let's roll some of that beautiful bean footage, shall we? With regard to the judge's other references to me in his judgment, I also want to reiterate, as I've consistently said for many years now, I've never hacked a phone or told anybody else to hack a phone. So I wasn't able to respond to the many false allegations that were spewed about me in court by all foes of mine with an axe to grind. Real cherry on top of this desperate Sunday is the ending. Very emotional, Merry Christmas. Uh, Mr. <laughs> the Merry Christmas at the end. Have you ever heard a less sincere Merry Christmas? That man wanted to say something else other than Merry Christmas, but oh, happy holidays. Hi, Piers. I just watched your rather petulant statement. You didn't like what the judge said about you, did you? Didn't like that he said that actually you probably did know about the phone hacking. I mean, you were the editor, Piers, so it does rest with you. If you didn't know about it, you were a poor editor. If you did know about it and you were lying, you're a poor editor. Whichever way you look at it, it's not very good, is it? But what I thought was interesting in your statement is that you tried to turn it into some patriotic duty to bring down this prince. And you try to call him out on stuff. But in real reality, he's not trying to bring down the monarchy. I know that's what your narrative is. I know that's what the tabloid narrative is. But he's not. He's trying to bring you down. He's trying to bring you and the British media down. Because it's dishonest. It's run by people that are trying to create a narrative in the country. So if you didn't want us to know about Harry and Meghan, you should all stop writing about them. It's really straightforward. They could disappear off the face of the earth tomorrow in terms of our media, but they don't. Every single day you churn out articles about nothing, but it's always to create a narrative of these two people are trying to do damage to the country. And actually, in reality, they're doing more to save the country by exposing the corruption of the media than anybody else right now. Anyway, as you were. In a historic decision by London's High Court, it was announced today that Prince Harry won his case against Mirror Group newspapers, with the ruling confirming that 15 of the 33 articles that were submitted to the court were written using illegal information gathering. And while a lot of people have had a lot to say on this court ruling, I want to look specifically at three statements, the Mirror Group's, Pierce Morgan's, and of course, Prince Harry's. After the court's decision was announced, MGN issued a statement in which they emphasized that these events took place years ago and are historical wrongdoings, which comes across as an effort to distance themselves from the illegal actions. And yes, journalists may have changed their methods for gathering information, as many people no longer use voicemail, but the culture of the UK press remains the same, if not worse. And phone hacking was not the only method of illegal information gathering mentioned in this case, Blagging financial and medical records, using surveillance, and actual burglary were claims as well. Also, several of the people named in the judgment, like Pierce Morgan, are still employed by news groups in the UK. There is no way to be certain that illegal information gathering is not still happening, and the Mirror Group's attempt to make it seem otherwise feels manipulative. Speaking of manipulative... Pierce Morgan had a very emotional response to the High Court's ruling and Prince Harry's statement. He chose his words very carefully in his public address, saying that he had never hacked anyone's phone or told anyone else to hack a phone. 
However, the judge's ruling was that Pierce was aware of the hacking and encouraged it to his own gain. Those things Pierce did not deny. He then went on to prove Harry right once again, resorting to vendetta journalism, as he has done for years to Harry and his family. Pierce attacked Omid Scobie and Alistair Campbell, who both testified in the trial, and then went on an enraged tirade against Harry, making his usual claims that Harry hurt his dying grandparents and is on a mission to take down the monarchy. Pierce then asserts himself into a defender of the monarchy role, saying he will do whatever he can to stop Harry and his wife, which may seem like an odd stance for a member of the media to take. Until we remember that Pierce enjoys a certain closeness with other members of the royal family, as it was only a year ago at this time when he joined Camilla for a private lunch. So Pierce equating Harry taking on the press to attacking the royal family is no coincidence, because by this point, Harry was supposed to either be silenced or back under the control of the firm, and the fact that he is neither of those things frightens some people. And based on Harry's statement today, it doesn't sound like he plans to be silenced any time soon. He included what is clearly a message for both the Daily Mail and The Sun, as his cases against both of those groups will go to trial soon, that he hopes this judgment serves as a warning to all media organizations who have also used these practices and lied about them. Harry ends his statement by saying, I've been told that slaying dragons will get you burned, but in light of today's victory, it is a worthwhile price to pay. And I don't think that Harry could have used a better analogy to describe his journey than this description of him slaying dragons. This is someone who from childhood was told he must be willing to sacrifice himself to save someone else, most often his brother. And those sacrifices often came in the form of Harry's character and reputation, but he was convinced it was his duty. He then spent 10 years in the army doing the same, putting himself in danger to fight a perceived enemy for the greater good. After a lifetime of calling him less than and expendable, the royal family may have inadvertently instilled in Harry all of the characteristics he would need to fight these powerful institutions. Except this time, the choice is his. He is sacrificing himself again, knowing his character and reputation will be attacked to protect others his mother's legacy, his wife, their children, and all of the people of Britain. But his journey isn't complete, and there are more dragons to slay. As Harry said, the mission continues. You might have seen the royal family legitimising the horrendous conditions that people in the UK are being forced into as part of an awful PR campaign. So the royals have recently been visiting a baby bank as part of the many poverty safaris that they like to undergo. If you're wondering what the baby bank is, it's a charity that provides essentials to families in extreme need. We are a G7 country. Now, there is nothing wrong with doing charity work. The issue is when people do it to boost their own personal profile and polling and fail to acknowledge why they have to do said charity work in the first place. So basically what the royal family is doing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, we've yet to see a royal attend one of the 1,400 food banks that we've got in this country operated by the Trust of Trust and say that the reason we have so many is because of Tory economic and social policy over the last 13 years. And people will say, well, the royals can't be political, but they are. I mean, just excluding the reasons behind a monarchy for a moment, their existence in this context is to be the friendly face of inequality and normalize these charities that exist because the Tories have created such dire living standards that people wouldn't survive without them. This is part of why we see the UK slipping back into Victorian levels of inequality because poverty is being normalized and not eliminated. We don't need shameless PR stunts motivated by a desperate need to beat racism allegations. We need meaningful action and change. I mean, take homelessness, for example. The UK charity crisis estimates it will cost 1.9 billion to completely eradicate poverty in this country. The royal family has an estimated net worth of 21 billion, which includes a property empire. Do you see what we're getting at here? But if you take one thing away from this, please remember that charity exists because the state has failed in its duty of care to its citizens. The reason that we have people suffering in our country the way they are is because political choices have been made to ensure that. The phrase hardest working royal is something of an oxymoron, but we now have the official numbers for engagements worked by members of the British royal family in 2023. Let's take a look, shall we? This is the Telegraph's analysis of something called the Court Circular, which is the official place to track every piece of royal work that a royal family member does throughout the year. In the old days, the Court Circular used to be printed in the daily newspaper. It would include things like the Queen Mother today was joined for lunch by Admiral such and such at St. James's Palace. Today, it really just 
includes their like professional work, not so much the social stuff. That does leave us with a pretty big range though. The coronation was one entry on the court circular this year, meaning that every person who attended the coronation from the royal family got to count this as an engagement. Also things like royal reception, the coronation concert, royal visits abroad, your bread and butter royal appearances out and about, and meetings. All of those things get included in the court circular, meaning that there is a wide range of time being committed to make up these numbers. On average, most royal engagements are about an hour long, which is how I choose to read something like this. So these are not days worked out of the calendar. These are not just events worked. I would say that these are hours worked. It's, it's a rough estimate, but that's how I would read this. Surprising absolutely no one, Princess Anne came out on top this year doing 450 57 royal engagements. Anne and Charles for the past few years have kind of been duking it out to see who comes out on top in the royal engagement. They often flip-flop. They are routinely the quote hardest working royals. 2019 is the last normal year of royal work. The pandemic really really messed with engagement numbers. A lot of royal events got cancelled or pivoted to Zoom. Zoom meetings also count as royal engagements by the way. I don't even have 2020 on my engagements tracker but 2021 was really weird because we were still coming out of COVID. Then 2020 too was weird because the queen passed away. This is the year that Kate infamously only did 90 engagements, less than the Duke of Gloucester, who is this year 79 years old. This year, again, she is doing fewer engagements than the Duke of Gloucester, who is also doing the same number as Prince William. And this is the sticking point for many people when we look at these engagement numbers from the royal family. Because you see people who are next in line to the throne, the Prince and Princess of Wales, carrying out far fewer engagements than the people who are not even ahead of them. Up here is Prince Edward, the Duke of Edinburgh, who is Queen Elizabeth's youngest child. He is doing almost 300 royal engagements. There has been quite a bit of talk about how King Charles might be manipulating the royal engagements to keep the spotlight on himself, dictating who can work on his behalf. But that is an excuse that really only gets used when we talk about the low numbers of Prince William and Catherine, the Princess of Wales. Another excuse that often gets parroted for them is that they are keeping their working numbers low to spend more time with their children. That I do believe because Will and Kate, they disappeared for seven straight weeks this summer, coinciding with their children's school holidays. They also took, I think, two weeks off for Easter. Those choices, I have to be careful here. Although remember, facts don't care about your feelings and we are just talking about raw data. The numbers do not lie. Those choices I think are intentional. I've also heard that Kate does not plan to up her workload until her children are adults, meaning that essentially she is going to be down here until after she becomes queen, likely. Queen Elizabeth, in contrast, was doing 295 engagements in 2019, a few years before she would pass away. So even in her 90s. All of this does play into what many are calling Prince William's grand strategy for when he eventually becomes king. Despite William having sworn to be King Charles' liege man of life and limb at the coronation, we are already treating King Charles' reign as transitional. And the Express this past weekend had a whole story detailing how William plans to modernize and streamline the monarchy when it's his turn. And you guessed it, though those five points included fewer royal engagements and fewer patronages. Translation, less work and less responsibility for members of the royal family. At the same time, he apparently also wants to continue slimming down the royal family, saying that when William and Kate are king and queen, their family will focus solely on the Waleses. At that time, that will be Prince George and his hypothetical wife and children. Bold, bold plan, especially coming from a couple who are getting outstripped by a 79 year old and his wife. And he is a grandson of King George V. Absolutely bananas. Let me know your thoughts on these working numbers in the comments. Remember, the numbers don't lie. If you want to tell me that I am hating on somebody for saying they don't work enough, the numbers are in front of you, folks. And if you also want to praise Princess Anne for being the hardest working royal, I think we have to take everything else in comparison to that and look at the picture of the royal family holistically here and ask ourselves, is this sustainable? Well, here you go, girl. Part eight of Endgame. Omid talks about the intertwined close relationship that Charles and Camilla have with the press and have had for many years. But since Charles has been coronated, it's even stronger than ever before as far as making sure that constant news gets pumped out in the British press that's positive toward the king. There are parties and events and things where the press are invited by him personally. Omid talks about a specific party in, I think, February of 2020 in Scotland that Charles hosted where he invited all the press. And this was a 
right around the time Meghan and Harry had moved and or were moving to America or Canada. They went to Canada first. You know what I mean. They moved out of the UK. And even though Charles said during this big elaborate party for the press that this was all off record, anything that happened during this party, everybody knows and has an understanding, even Charles, that nothing is really ever off record. And so when he was asked at this party, you know, your thoughts about Meghan and Harry leaving, da 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 da, Charles said something along the effect of like, well, I'm very sad, of course, but, you know, I made sure that everything worked out for them and that they had safe passage and everything is straight, even though they're very stubborn. I did all that I could to ensure that they were taken care of. And sure enough, shortly after this off-the-record party, there is press in the British, you know, tabloids saying that Meghan and Harry, you know, King Charles did all he could for Meghan and Harry and they're ungrateful, blah, 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 blah. So, girl, it's like all a bunch of bullshit. Omid also says that, you know, even though at times the royal family and Charles can manipulate and almost like, you know, woo the press into saying nice things about them, the press over there can easily flip with a switch. And they know this, especially Charles, he knows this, which is why he takes the time to be nice to them and woo them because he wants them to always talk about him and Camilla in a good light. So it's this constant, like, you know what it is? This is a side note from anything in Omen's book. Why are they so obsessed with the press over there in that country? We, like, we are not even close over here in the U.S. Like, of course, we have similarities and stuff, but they are just obsessed you know what it reminds me of it's like the wizard of oz where at the end they get to oz and they hear this big voice i'm the great wizard of oz and i'm all powerful blah, blah, blah. and as he's talking they pull back the curtain and look and it's this stinky little guy talking into a microphone and they're like what is going on here girl and it's all a charade that's what i feel like is going on over there in the uk i'm sorry i said it they're so obsessed with the appearance bitch anyway again it's all about maintaining so let's uh, move from Charles and talk about Prince Andrew, shall we? So when all the shit was going down with Prince Andrew, all the way back to like 2011, when his friendship with Epstein, like people were catching wind of it after all these allegations and arrests and stuff with Epstein happened. And then after the 2019 death of Epstein and then all the allegations from, you know, like the young woman, Virginia, who was a minor at the time that alleged, you know, that she had to sleep with uh, Andrew and all this. And then even after the interview that Prince Andrew did, that was terrible. He, okay, the royal family was reluctant or very, very slow to punish him in any kind of way. And the British public... All of them were like, what? even the military girl had said and reached out to the palace and was like, uh, if this was any other person in the military, he would have been stripped of all his shit. We are asking you, queen, to strip your son of all his shit. And even though Prince Charles publicly, you know, obviously didn't condone any of Andrew's actions. He himself was very sympathetic. He didn't want to be the one to like get the ball rolling to strip his brother of all the things, girl. And according to Omid, it was William who got that ball rolling. Sources said that William was really upset with the palace and the royal family and even the queen with their lack of action that he didn't believe that his father basically was competent enough. He didn't think his grandmother, the queen, would be harsh enough because Andrew's like known to be the favorite son of Queen Elizabeth or was the favorite son. And, you know, so William's like, he, she's not going to do enough. I need to forcefully speak with my grandmother and let her know, yo, granny wake up he got to go and so William did he said he said his grievances to them and he's like something's got to happen in this family 
There needs to be a different way we lead. We gotta be harsh sometimes. And William is not afraid to be harsh. I think we all know that by now. Now, it is said by sources that the queen always believed in her son's innocence which is why she was very slow or reluctant to do anything about it. Omid says he's known to be probably one of the most extremely spoiled of all the royals. He's never had to answer or own up to anything in his life. He's had a very pampered, spoiled life. His mother, the queen, kind of just catered to him very much, as is well known. And even an incident like this going on with him and the press knowing about his friendship with Jeffrey Epstein for the last decade, really. He doesn't care. Uh, sources say that, you know, nobody really, he, nobody challenges him. Not even Fergie. Also, I didn't know that him and Fergie live in the same house. Did you know that? They have been living together up to this day. And while they're not romantically involved and they're divorced, it is said they are closer than ever. Listen, they say it's for convenience and for family, but also people are like, well, bitch, both of them are broke. <laughs> so then I don't know that living thing. I don't know. Listen, I, there's a lot. This family, you're talking about people that throw a tantrum if their egg isn't boiled correctly. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, hit that notification bell.